Well, good morning, friends. It really is a great joy to be able to be back here at the Believers Fellowship and to share in the wonderful worship and in this revival. It's always good to get back to a church where I've been before because then I don't have to explain that I do not suffer from a speech impediment. (laughs) Our English happens to be a little different to yours. Of course, when your great preachers come to our country with your use of the King's English, we have to have somebody with the gift of interpretation (laughs) so that we can follow. We've had a wonderful time of blessing and refreshing at the men's retreat, and it certainly has been a joy to be with the men. But I'm looking forward for this time with the congregation And my prayer is that God's blessing will rest upon the ministry here. A word of thanks to those who have prayed for us. We thank you for your prayers out there on the various mission fields of the world, in South Africa, uh, South America, and out in Asia, where the concentration of our ministry is. I'm on my way to Cambodia shortly, then across to South America, to Peru, Brazil, as we seek to fulfill the ministry that God has granted to us of reaching out to the unreached parts of the world. There are still untold millions, still untold. And the job of the church is to go. And we thank God for the many open doors that he has granted to us. And we need your prayers for that in a special way. Now, I do plan to be with us during these next few days. Um, we trust in God for wonderful times together. But I trust that you plan to be with us. I've come 12,000 miles to be with you. And you'll come across the street to be with us. <laughs> I'm reminded of the old gentleman that used to be very faithful in church. He never missed the service. Come rain, come snow, he was there dressed in his best. And he... Loved to be there. The only problem was he couldn't uh, understand a thing that was going on because he was stone deaf. Uh, But he'd be there. He couldn't hear the singing. He couldn't participate in uh, the worship time. He couldn't hear the sermons. But he was there. And somebody wrote him a little letter once and said, What's the point of coming? And uh, you can't hear a thing that goes on. What's the point of being in church? And he replies back and says, I'm there every Sunday, every service, because I want my neighbors and the world to see on whose side I am. That's what it is. They watch us and they see what we do Sunday morning and Sunday night to see how committed are these people, how serious are they about their faith. They compare us with the other religions and they find that somehow there is a need for us to tighten up and to make sure that we are fully identified. When I think of uh, the early disciples in the book of Acts, they would gather every day uh, to worship and to sing the praises and to study the doctrine. Why? They were serious. They'd met with the Holy Spirit. And this was this what characterized the early church and small wonder. It survived the onslaught of Rome. And we are sitting here today because of faithful people who've held the banner and refused to compromise. And we look forward to a great time together as we tell the world we're serious about what we believe. And there are people in parts of the world where I've been who cannot gather like this, who do not have the facilities or the freedoms to gather like this. When I was in uh, uh, India, They said, if you preach for less than an hour, we'll be offended. Yeah, if you preach for more than an hour, you're offended. (laughs) But then it's been interpreted, don't forget, so it's two hours. And they're sitting on the floor because people are serious. They want the word. And that is so essential in these critical days that we become men and women who are committed to Jesus and are unashamed are belonging to him. So let's be much in prayer for these days and make the sacrifice and invite others and plan to be here 
And there is no telling what God can do when we respond like that. Now we're going to turn to John's Gospel, a well-known passage of Scripture that we want to look at this morning. We, <coughs> uh, verse 1, John chapter 5. Now after this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people blind, lame, paralyzed waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at certain time in the day, at a certain time in the uh, time in, into the pool, and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew all that knew that he had already been there in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred, stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. That day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, see you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. May the Lord interpret those words into our hearts in a very special way today. Let's bow for just a moment in prayer as we quietly gather our many thoughts and focus upon Christ. Father, we come to you on this first day of the week. We gather in your name and for your sake. We gather because we long to publicly and on a community basis declare our loyalty and our worship of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We draw near and we pray that you will draw near to us as you've promised to do. You are aware of every one of us here, all that's happening in our lives and has happened we pray for fresh cleansing in your precious blood from those things that are foreign to you and teach us what it means to trust you and to walk with you and to allow God into every area and every kingdom of our hearts and lives. We thank you for the life and the witness of this church and congregation, for the vision and for the ministry we pray for your continued anointing and blessing to rest upon this place and to all that are associated and connected to this church. We pray for your encouragement. We pray for your guidance and wisdom. And then we pray today for those that need your touch, physically or emotionally. Some are going through possibly deep waters, anxious about the future, the job situation, the family situation. And we thank you we can come to you this morning and cast out every care upon you because you care for us. 
And we pray that as we consider your word, that in your grace and mercy, you will minister truth, liberating truth. And teach us how to respond in faith and allow your truth to infiltrate every part of our decision-making processes, every part of our activities. And we pray that indeed your spirit will abide with us. Now grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts shall be acceptable, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, for we ask it in the name which is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. amen. And amen. I think we're all familiar with this story of what happened at the pool of Bethesda. It was a place where people would gather on a regular basis. It was a public place. And uh, it was a place where many of the invalids, the disadvantaged, the Bible lists them here as the blind and the lame, the sick, the paralyzed. And amongst them was this man that had laid on his bed for 38 years. It had been a long, long time. Time. And so as the people would lie there, it was a place where pity was shown because of the needs of the people. It was a place where power was known because the Bible tells us here that at a certain time in the day, the angel would come down and stir the waters and many who got into those waters would come out wonderfully healed and restored. There was power in that place. It was also a place where many of the Pharisees and the Jews would gather uh, to watch what was going on, to see that everything was politically and religiously correct. And they were all there. It was a place where uh, patience was exercised because many would watch others being healed but would miss the opportunity themselves due to a variety of reasons. And so we find it was here in this place with a variety of needs, a variety of opinions that were assembled that Jesus makes his way. And the Bible says that Jesus saw a man in particular need. And he asks him a very penetrating question. He says these words here in verse number uh, six, which I think is so pertinent. He says, uh, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? I think that's a question every one of us at some stage or another in our lives have to answer. Do you really want what Jesus has to offer. Not what the world has to offer, we've taken that. But do we want what Jesus has to offer us? For what he has to offer us, friends, cost him his life. What he has to offer us is exactly what we need. Even though sometimes we are blinded to our real needs. And here is a man, 38 years, and Jesus comes at a strategic point in his life. You see, this man had, a, had certain problems because of the disadvantage in life. He had never really lived. 38 years were wasted. He'd never really lived. Isn't it sad to think that some people, when they die, they've never lived? They've gone through the motions. They've done what the world has demanded and expected us to do and fulfill all those kind of expectations, but they've never enjoyed the abundant life that Jesus Christ offers and that he died on the cross to purchase. They've never lived. And here's a man who can look back over 38 years of his life and they're wasted. He's never enjoyed the life that Christ wanted to offer him. 
the tragedy of a wasted life. More than that, he was on the edge of the second half of his life. The first is gone. And all it was used for getting and gaining. But after 38 years, quite frankly, he had no legacy to pass on. Nothing to show. Nothing to offer. Second half was before him. And he knew that he was in no position to turn what he might have thought as successors into any kind of significance. Because that's what we are called to do. Not just to be successful, but to turn our successors into significances. This was this man's condition. A pretty pathetic sight. It's the story of multitudes of people today who've lived life in terms of the dictates of society and fulfill those requirements and on the outside appear to be successful, but something has died on the inside. And you come into another chapter in your life and you wonder what the future holds. But then the Bible tells us Jesus came. An opportunity came his way that he had never expected. An ordinary day became a special day in his life. The moment for which he was born. A turning point in his life. (coughs) He needed to live for something greater than his interests. Surely there was more to life than this. The only kind of identity of his life was a pathetic failure until Jesus came that way. And he asked him a very important question. And this question would determine so much of his future. It was how he responded to the question that Jesus directed to him. And Jesus said to him, do you want to be made whole? Do you want a new lifestyle? Do you want what you've yearned for over 38 years? Do you want to see what others have experienced and not you? A radical shift from where you are. I don't think that he realized what it meant. What was Jesus meaning? Do you want to be made whole? Oh yes, I'd like to get out of this bed and be able to walk and enjoy life like everybody else. But Jesus was meaning something far different to that. Oh, it included that, friends, but far more than that. It would mean you'll have to follow me then the rest of your life. It would mean a radical change in your lifestyle. It'll mean you've come out of that self-constructed bomb shelter that you have now built around your life in 38 years. Was he interested in that? He'd, he was now 38. There are seven life changes taking place in his life. He'd become entrenched in his thinking and his attitudes. He'd begun to accept his lifestyle. His mindsets were formed and formulated and concreted. And Jesus is about to disrupt that entire structure. It was going to be a radical change. You see, meeting with Jesus is far more, is far more, friends, than just some kind of a reversal of our religious opinions. It's an encounter whereby our lives are never the same again. We'd like to keep onto our old life, our lifestyle, and the things that suit us that we are so accustomed to. Jesus comes and he interrupts it all. Look at this man's condition, 38 years of paralysis, a total waste. 
That was his condition. Nothing to show. He envied others. But he was only a spectator. He joined the company of those that were with him like a huge hospital ward. The blind, the lame, the withered. <clears throat> and the only hope for these benighted people was death. There was no future. There was no joy. There was no reality. But the day Jesus came, you'll notice in verse 6, two things that Jesus noticed about this man. Jesus saw him where he was, singled him out from the crowd that were there. He saw a man whose heart was aching. He saw a life that was broken and wasted. He saw a life <clears throat> whose dreams had been shattered and who could do nothing to help himself. Jesus saw him. But Jesus also knew him. He knew how long the pain had been. He knew how long the life of disillusionment had been. He knew his life the beginning through to the end. My friends, that's exactly true today. He knows where you are. He knows your address. He knows your name. He knows your circumstances. He knows how long you've lived in a spiritual bubble. How long we've lived a lie. How long We've lived in self-deception. He sees it all. He chose to do something about it. He could walk by on the other side, but he chooses not to. Why? Because he has a special love for you and for me. He has a special interest, a special concern. This man never asked Jesus for help. Maybe it's, he'd come to the place when he just accepted his condition. See? But instead, Jesus offers it to him. Maybe he was bound by the limits of his understanding, and I think very often this is our problem, because in verse 13 we notice, that uh, the one who was healed did not know who it was. He did not know who he was dealing with. He wasn't just dealing with some prophet passing by, some itinerant preacher. He wasn't just dealing with some religious leader friends. No, he was dealing. He didn't know who Jesus was. But he was actually dealing with the Son of God. The God that created him. The God that knew his life. The God that had a plan for his life. He forgot with whom he was dealing. And when the Son of God comes to you and to me and says this morning, do you want to be made whole? Do you realize whom you are negotiating with? It's the God of creation. It's the God of redemption. It's the God of salvation. The one that loves you. The one that set the boundaries of your life. The day where you're born and the day you'll die. He knows everything about you. You find yourself within the framework of a divine design. That's whom we're dealing with. Not some preacher. He confronts us. And he says, do you want to be made whole? Well, Lord, I'd like to get out of this situation. But you see, there were other things he wanted to do for this man. He wanted to make him whole. Heal my body. No, I've got more than that. There's your total being I'm interested in. There's a design for you. <clears throat> if he was made well, he could lose a very profitable kind of income because he could get an income without having to work. Isn't that a good deal? A beggar made quite a bit of money. All that would be gone now. Oh, well, hang on. I'm not sure if I want to change. Because how am I going to live? See? He was, Jesus was trying to introduce him a new lifestyle. 
then of course he seemed to be quite good at the blame game. And verse 7 tells us about the fact that uh, he'd want to go down into that pool where there was healing. But uh, he said, others go before me. And I could never get into that pool that the angel has stirred and experienced the healing power of those waters. Never. Why? Because of the others. Because someone else is always in my way. It's their fault that I'm in this condition. I tell you, friends, life hasn't changed much, has it? We're all in that condition again and again. We can blame that wicked husband. We can blame those parents. We can blame... Uh, Everybody we can think of except the one that's responsible. You see. And he goes through this motion. You see, if he wanted to be whole, he wouldn't be blaming anyone. He'd say, well, I need the healing. He was blind to the moment that had come. Full of excuses. Still wrecked in pain, still staying there without any kind of a possibility of a future. But what he was blind to was that when Jesus came that way and asked him that question, this was to be the greatest moment in his life. How blind he was to this. He said, I can't. I can't get to the waters. So guess what happens, friends? The water of life comes to him to find him right there. We're dealing with a God that comes to you and to me and knocks at our door and says to you, do you want to be made whole? He's leaving the response to you. You can decide. You can say, I'm going to remain like this if I like. Or else you can say, I'm accepting that offer. I don't understand it all. But if Jesus, the Son of God, could offer me, make an offer like that, I'm prepared to reach out in faith and trust Him, my whole life to Him. You see, His life would have to be changed now. Do you want, do you wish to be well, be made whole? The life of begging would be over. That easy form of income would be gone. What a change. Go and sin no more, he says in verse 13. Uh, verse 12, rather. Uh, sorry, verse uh, 14. Now, what sin had this man, could he possibly done? He could never have got up to rob, rob a bank. He could never get up and kill somebody or involved in some adulterous relationship. So what sin has the man committed? You see, friends, it's the same sin we all commit. Jesus wasn't in his life. It was a broken relationship with Jesus. That's the biggest sin you can commit, is not to be right with God. The murderer doesn't go to hell because he kills somebody. He goes to hell because he doesn't know Christ. And because he doesn't know Christ, then we are capable of any kind of sin. This was his problem. He had no idea who was addressing him, what the opportunity was all about. He had no idea. As I said to them in the other day, we have control over the choices we make, but we have no control over the consequences of those choices. And the man here is called. Now the interesting thing about this story is if you look at what happened here with uh, verse 9, it says the day was the Sabbath. Verse 10, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath, it is not lawful. Immediately this transaction is about to become a reality. There is a deviation. The religious leaders of the day deviated his attention to the rules of the law by which life was regulated in those days. To get him off guard. To get his attention away. And I find many folks who, who've begun to rise, they've met Jesus, and then there comes a deviation into your life. Something happens. One man said to me, uh, the day I started to walk closer with Jesus, everything went wrong in the business. 
and immediately his attention is drawn away. And very often we rise and call ourselves Christians and followers of Christ, but somehow something else deviates us away from the walk with Jesus and understanding what it's all about. They so far, but no further. And then you get into that transition position whereby you've come out, but you haven't gone in. Whereby you've come out of the land of darkness, but you're still not in the land of light. You've got enough religion to make you miserable, not enough to make you happy. See, And you're not enjoying the Christian life. It's become a routine. And it's lost the dynamic. It's lost the romance. And we're caught in between. And for a while he's knocked off balance. But you see, Jesus does not forget him. It says in verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple, half dazed, beginning to walk, but faltering, beginning to walk, but the joy is not there. He's caught in between the most miserable state in the world to tell, say you're a Christian friend, but you're not enjoying the Christian life and walking the heights with God and experiencing everything that Jesus purchased on the cross for you. You're caught in that trap. You're in that between station. Now, Jesus comes to where he is. I find that amazing. He's confused, he's dazed, he's not where he'd like to be, he's not what he was, and he's in this middle road, in this no man's land. Jesus does not leave us. The Bible says, Philippians 1, 2, that being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. My friend, he's not gonna leave you He's not going to lose you. He's begun something and he ain't finished yet. He's after you. Don't run away now. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He's still there. Jesus comes there. He cannot forsake him. He sees us in the misery. He sees us going through all kinds of doubts and fears. And Jesus comes here and says these interesting words. See, you've been made well, verse 14. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. We've already established what kind of sin. What you need to establish is what's worse. The worst, what's worse now? Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Many have got into that situation. You say, well, what does that mean? He's following Jesus. We're trying to. He's healed, but not whole. He is walking, but he's not walking in the light. We have a trial case back in South Africa for a man by the name of Oscar Pistorius. Some of you have heard about this on the news here. It's quite a famous trial of a certain athlete who had lost his, the use of his legs and he still ran in the uh, Olympics in London and won a gold medal. But then he comes back and shoots his girlfriend. And he's on trial on a murder charge. A, a letter was written to one of our magazines just prior to the actual murder. And the letter was from a lady who'd been a nurse. And she'd worked in a children's hospital. And she said, one day I was in the operating theater and they brought a little boy in to have his legs amputated. And I cried all the way home, she said, to think that, that little boy would have to go through the rest of his life without his legs. That little boy was Oscar Pistorius. She said, but I'm, a, I'm thrilled to see how that he's made something out of his life. He's become a gold medal in the Olympics. And shortly after that letter, he shoots his girlfriend. He's got his legs right. He can walk, he can run, but guess what? He's walking in the wrong direction. That's the worst thing that can happen. That when God blesses you, you go in the wrong direction. 
You sit there thinking everything is okay now. I've got eternal life. I can never lose it. And therefore I can live as I like. And I can throw my life away. My friends, it doesn't work like that. You love Jesus now. You made whole on the inside. But to go back and walk in darkness and in unbelief and in rebellion is about the worst thing you can go do. Repent. Lest a worse thing come upon you. The worst thing that could have come upon him? That you go back to a dead religion like those Jews who were judging you. And you talk all about your faith and all about religion. If you're challenged, you say, well, I am a Christian. But it's dead. That's the worst thing. Why? Because you make a mockery of Calvary. Jesus did not die on the cross so you can live a backslidden life and a fruitless life. He died and rose again that he might be Lord of the living and the dead. What could be worse than to go and live the next 38 years of your life, the second half of your life, as you were? That'll be worse. But you're walking, but nothing's been shown for it. You see, something happened in this man's life from that moment. He'd received now a healing on God's terms, not his own anymore. Many want God just to heal us physically and raise us up. But now, sir, you've got to follow me. Now you've got to walk like you've never walked before. Your company, your values, everything changes because now you're walking in the light as he is in the light. You see, from now onwards, Jesus becomes the reason for our living. It says here in verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him whole. Before then, he didn't even know who Jesus was, even though he was healed. He had a relationship with Jesus whereby it meant nothing to him. But now in verse 15, wherever he goes, the very reason why he's alive, is because of Jesus. There's accountability now. There's a new lifestyle. There's no half measures. There's no coming back to the old lifestyle anymore, like the dog returning to its vomit. It's a new walk. There's a future here. Why? He's got his hand in the hand of Jesus. Isn't it far more important to have your hand in the hand of the one that knows the future, that's planned the future, friends, than trying to walk alone? He now has a new reputation, a new identity. Do you know what it is? He's now going to be known as the man that Jesus healed. That's how he'd be known. Here's a man that's met Jesus. How come he's walking? How come he's living? How come he's serving? Because someday he met Jesus. That's his reputation. That's his identity. Any other kind of identity is false. Any other kind of value is idolatry. A new reputation. When you're made whole, you're known as a man, a woman, a family that one day met Jesus and they changed forever. Is that your story, friend? Do your neighbors know that? You're known as in your family. That family met Jesus. We don't understand them, but they met Jesus. Think of one man when he came home, he used to be so drunk, even his dog would run away. But when he got saved and met Jesus, his dog didn't even know who he was. You see. Is that real? Or will you answer that question this morning? Do you want to be made whole? You're not here this morning by accident or coincidence. But you're here by divine appointment. 
We could come and sit here and sit here and sit here. Nothing happens. But then Jesus comes and taps you on the shoulder and says, that day is dawn. For some, it's now or never. Don't miss the opportunity. Take it and say, Lord, I want to be made whole. I can't remain down there anymore. I can't remain confused and dead on the inside anymore. I want to be made whole. You do that, my friend, as we bow in a moment of prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed as we think over what we've heard.